What is Westbeth? Westbeth is located in New York City's West Village at West Street and Bethune Street. It started its current life as an artist's residence in the late 1960s when nearly 400 units were created to house living and working spaces for visual, performing, and literary artists. It takes up an entire city block. It was originally built as a factory for the Western Electric Company of Chicago in 1894 and was taken over by American Telegraph and Telephone in 1907. This was the first home of Bell Labs. Here the first vacuum tube was created in 1912 and the amplifier in 1915. These inventions helped to pave the way for records and later sound motion pictures. Even radar had its early development here. And other major inventions followed. Television and color television, the microphone, and hi-fi sound. So the connection with the arts is deeply embedded in the history of West Beth itself. Internationally recognized artists such as Merce Cunningham in dance, Gil Evans in jazz, Diane Arbus in photography, and Muriel Rukeyser in poetry are among the hundreds of artists who have called Westbeth their creative home. The World Trade Center was about two miles south of Westbeth. I remember the July before the World Trade Center attack. Um, my partner and I went to a concert um, outside by the World Financial Center, and we saw Yuma Sakela, who was absolutely fabulous. And it was one of those wonderful New York evenings where the World Trade Center was in the background, and the sun was setting behind us in the Hudson River. And it was just like one of those magical New York City nights where everyone was dancing, and it was just a very, very special evening. Uh, growing up here in West Beth, which is right along the Hudson River and probably about a mile uh, down there would be the World Trade Center. And where I grew up, our windows look right out onto the World Trade Center. So periodically, whenever I wanted to look at something pretty amazing, I would look out the window and I'd see the World Trade Center. When we moved into West Beth 30 years ago, uh, they were still constructing uh, Tower Number 2. And uh, we watched it go up, that's all of West Beth watched it uh, being built. There was a lovely park there, and, uh, and the low-built uh, low buildings were, they were all beautiful to look at to me, and uh, they were a wonderful match for the magnificent height of those, those towers. Oh, it was a convenient place for me to bring my children. We had birthday parties there, and my children performed, and concerts when they were part of the Metropolitan Opera Children's Chorus and uh, there were arts events. I had some ex artwork exhibited there. I had friends who had uh, cultural events, um, concerts, and it was a fun place. Hi, uh, my name is Tom Duncan and uh, I'm a sculptor. I, I live and work in uh, West Beth. I've been here for over 30 years and uh, my uh, connection to the World Trade Center is um, I was a, um, an architectural model maker and uh, working for the Port Authority and uh, I did the original study models of the World Trade Center and um, I did this uh, while I, w I was going to art school so in effect um, that, that uh, paid my way to go through art school. I personally never really um, liked the architecture of the World Trade Center. I thought it was a little sterile. Um, but on the other hand, I, I was uh, very uh, proud to have been a part of the creation of the, uh, the World Trade Center. Um, at, at that time, um, there, was the, there was nothing like that. Uh, they, they were, the Port Authority was trying to sell the idea to the governor at the time, Nelson Rockefeller, and uh, the, the actual original study model was down below the, um, the, the, the Brooklyn Bridge on the, on, the, on the East River side, but there were some problems uh, with the bedrock, and also there was a federal building down there that they didn't really want to build around. But the most important thing for me personally 
was that it was always a place that I could work and make money because as an artist, as an, and an adjunct college professor, in between semesters and in between jobs, I would work there in uh, various capacities. I worked as uh, office temp, I worked as paralegals, all kinds of different things. Yeah, my connection with the World Trade Center and the firemen was, um, seems like forever. I used to go to the events, the musical events. I used to go shopping un underneath. I used to go to the World Trade Tower just to have drinks so if any visitors came in, I could show them all of New York. It was a magnificent building on very many levels, on so many levels. I would like to show you a, a photograph that I have of the original uh, model. Um, I was checking my records and, and I didn't realize that I had actually worked on three different study models of the World Trade Center, and I believe that this is the first one um, that was on, uh, actually on the, uh, by the East River where the uh, South Street Seaport is. It was a place, it was just part of my childhood. I saw it growing up. I would ride my bike along Battery Park City while they were building it um, to the beach before it became Battery Park City. I'd always go down, when the first part of the promenade was built, I'd go down there on my bike and write in my journal. and. Um, it's just a fascinating, fascinating place because it was kind of empty and changing all the time and the towers were always a part of that. I really admired the, the way that they looked. I know supposedly architectures, or, uh, architects criticize it, but I as a kid, I'm not being knowledgeable, I was amazed by the size of them and the symmetry of the two buildings. Um, and I just really liked the way they looked at it, especially at night. I remember I would sometimes go down to the river by myself and I would just go around and look and look at the buildings downtown. I really thought they were amazing. When I was 10 years old, I had my birthday party on the observation deck of Tower 2. Um, and a lot, all my friends from St. Luke's School, where I went, uh, came. And uh, I remember a lot of, some of the kids wanted to put their head up against the glass and get the feeling of vertigo um, that they were falling. Um, unfortunately, at the same time in light or from, in perspective, um, we can see that that obviously has a sort of eerie feeling considering what happened in September 11th. I also had a connection with the World Trade Center because I teach at Borough of Manhattan Community College and I don't know if you can see the school catalog but these are our students and in the background is the World Trade Center which we actually considered part of our campus and uh, one of our buildings Fitterman Hall uh, which was four blocks below the main campus on Chambers Street was very close to the World Trade Center. In fact, it was destroyed during the World Trade Center attack. Seven World Trade Center fell on Fitterman Hall, which is actually where I was supposed to be on September 11th, but I didn't get there because my class was at 11.30. I never liked the World Trade Center, really. I never thought it was a very pretty building, but it's a very strong graphic image, and I've used it in illustration. Uh, some examples of uh, illustrations that I've used it in a uh, Japanese in New York and here's the World Trade Center through the window and um, then I've used it again in another piece for entering the business place. these are promotional pieces and you can see the foot coming in and sort of squelching the World Trade Center although I didn't mean it to be that way at the time this was all done quite long ago I would watch it outside of the uh, large window in the hall uh, every day on a daily basis and it became not about the uh, physicality of the architecture but how the architecture related to the weather, to the clouds. And I would see sunsets, sunrises and also beautiful sort of different times the mists would cover up the two towers partially and the lights would come through and it was so romantic. It was a case of watching it in the morning and in the evening. When I came home from work, I would look up and uh, see it through the window and say over and over, I made it to New York and I was so proud. This particular day, 9-11, I had uh, an appointment with Westbeth. I remembered that uh, before I left, in the mornings, uh, to sort of wake me up and get going, I turned on the television. Well, there was no television. It wasn't working this morning. By September, I had decided to return to teaching, although I had been offered a position at Fiduciary Trust on the 95th floor. Um, but I said, well, let me go back. My third graders will miss me. 
So I'll let you know in a couple of months if I want to come back to uh, working for you. Had it not been for my third graders, um, I would have been sitting at 8 o'clock on the 95th floor with Fiduciary Trust. Instead, I was sitting with my third graders in Bedford Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, for which I'm very grateful. On 9-11, I was sitting right over there uh, in my Wasserly chair, speaking to uh, one of my favorite students on the phone. His name was Michael Noth, and Michael had gone on to join the Navy. He was, became a naval illustrator. We were chatting on the phone. It was uh, in the 9 o'clock area, and he was at the Pentagon. It felt as though an airplane went through my back, and I said, oh, my God. Um, something's weird, there's an airplane flying too low. So I, I threw the phone down, I ran out in the hall to look uh, at, towards the World Trade Center, the largest view, and I saw a very tiny airplane, it looked like a toy, spin around and it appeared as though it went into the World Trade Center. And I thought it was a tiny, small plane, so I screamed, and uh, West Beth being all artists, the doors all opened and usually most buildings would have people at, at their morning jobs. And I said, a tiny plane has gone into the World Trade Center. People said a small plane came right over. It was low, uh, flying over 6th Avenue. In the morning, I got a call from my brother in Park City, Utah, near Salt Lake. And it was to wake me up to say that the World Trade Center was disappearing. And from tower number two, there was black smoke. And it looked terrible. It was only at the top. But I thought, oh, something terrible is going on there. I went up on the roof. All there was was smoke. So we ran up to the roof, Mara, Tony, and myself. And we took about 500 pictures of that, including this picture right here that's all over the world. It was in a window in Athens, Greece. It was in Italy, in Milan. And then all of a sudden, I look, there's a second one. Suddenly we stood there and watched it melt, just like you put tea in your, uh, uh, put sugar in your tea and it just melts down. And it, it just was an incredible sight because it didn't seem real. Well, a couple minutes later, we all saw the second plane come around and hit. And everyone screamed, um, and everyone was really scared. And everyone knew immediately at that point, any possibility of an accident we knew was, was, not, was, was gone. There was an explosion of violent, a tremendous explosion of fire right across uh, the, the expanse of the whole street that we could see. And I'm on my way to school and the trains, I was hopping on a uh, two train line on 174th. And as I'm on the platform, I look up in the sky and I see nothing but smoke. I get to 42nd Street, that was the cutoff point from there. Everybody who was on the train or on a bus had to get off. And I get outside and I see people running, I see people like chalked up, looking like they just got debris or fire. When it started to, to implode, it was, it was just, it was shocking. There's, there really isn't a word to describe what it was like to see that, to have been standing there to watch the plane go in, to watch it burn, to imagine whatever you could, and then to see it explode. Suddenly a friend called and said, you know what, there's something very odd happening in your apartment. The telephone's ringing, and uh, it's ringing in a very loud manner. I ran down to my apartment, picked up the phone. It was Michael, my student. And he said, uh, Karen, something very serious is happening. It's possibly a terrorist act. And I'm very worried about you since they've hit the World Trade Center. And all of a sudden, I heard a big explosion. My friends looked down and said, wow, they just hit the Pentagon. Where did you say that phone call was from? And I was holding the phone. And I said, the Pentagon, but the line is out. Five days later, my dear Michael was found. I was devastated. As I watched the black smoke, just black smoke coming out of the uh, uh, tower, tower number two. Then flames came licking through the smoke, just licking through. And then we saw people, people going out of the windows. And uh, this was pretty horrifying. And all of a sudden, we saw the buildings 
begin to move. Well, buildings don't move. And everybody hollered and screamed. It's like all over the world, they were screaming and hollering that this is what's happening. And, and then uh, the, um, the fog of, of uh, the, the dust and the debris covered the rest. And in the count of one, two, three came that horrible crash. That indescribable, that uh, we thought of uh, the firemen and the policemen and all the people in it. And uh, we knew immediately how many human beings were being consumed there. That looks really bad right now. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. oh shit. Here it comes. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus. Oh, my God. Well, look, look at whoever they are. Oh my this, God! This building. You know how many hundreds of thousands? You know how many thousands of people just died? The thousands on the street everywhere. I think when the second one fell, the most devastating thing was watching the cloud that then came up afterwards and figuring that from the entirety of Lower Manhattan, from that perspective up on the roof of West Beth, that everything in Lower Manhattan had just been obliterated. And to my mind, since I figured that they were nuclear bombs, I really did think, you know, millions of people just died and I'm about to die too. Um, so it was, it was a terrifying, terrifying moment. Um, right after the second building came down, I hopped on my bicycle and just rode down there. And it was really before there was really even any security in place. And I was riding through this whole bunch of dust on the street. And, and it was an incredibly surreal situation. 9-11 basically paralyzed me for, for uh, doing art for quite a while. I became very ill because I was trapped in downtown Brooklyn. I ended up trying to get home from Brooklyn and walking for hours and hours, breathing in all that stuff in downtown Brooklyn and in lower Manhattan, finally when I could get to Manhattan. And I started feeling very weak. Um, by Friday, I was in the hospital with pneumonia. And it took me weeks and weeks to recover. Uh, and actually, I didn't really have my strength back for a year. We were kind of figuring out what to do. Really didn't know. There were people filming it. Suddenly, St. Vincent's Hospital was a couple blocks away. And there were people coming up re requesting blood. So immediately, I went to go give blood with a couple people. And we waited for so long. And they separated us by blood types. And they told everyone who wasn't A, B, or O to go home after a while. I happened to meet some people who were in the building. I mean, it was really amazing, the, the outreach of New Yorkers. If you compare that to what people would consider New Yorkers to be. I think that was really amazing to see that. Um, obviously, we were, it was very sad, but that was one positive thing I definitely took out of that day. And then after that, I went down to the West Side Highway, and I guess now it's about maybe, I don't know, 1 o'clock, and that was when people started to suddenly appear with the signs, okay? And everybody was out there, thousands of people, hundreds of people were out there with signs and clapping and cheering and painting pieces of wood, thank you, and it, there were hundreds of cars coming from all over, you know, fire engines, ambulances, all kinds of vehicles coming from all over the tri-state area at that point. It was still local. Um, and everyone was cheering and waving and practically falling off the median. So this is how this whole business of cheering the rescue workers started, which um, continued for a very long time. And um, suddenly I realized that um, this was what I was going to do for however long it took. I also didn't have a job because Manhattan Community College was closed. So uh, I didn't have a job to go to. So suddenly cheering the rescue workers became my job. And this is pretty much what I did for a month until pretty much my job reopened. Uh, I, I couldn't stay away. I, I, it took me a couple of days to figure out how to get down there. But uh, I did finally get in there and it was really interesting. It was like being in a war without the danger. The rescue was over after the third day. So the, and the recovery really, recovery really hadn't begun yet because there was so much steel in the way. And I went down there almost every day, and I knew this was really special and really important. And every day I would go down to the site, and uh, to the highway rather, Christopher Street and uh, West Side Highway, which was what became Point Thank You on Hero Highway. 
and the crowds diminished as the days went on, as the weeks went on. But there was a good core of maybe 30, 40 of us who came, maybe 10, 15 at a time. And I was there almost every day. Um, and it was really a good thing to do because the workers would stop and they would tell us how much they appreciated what we were doing and um, they would thank us. And we were like, wait a minute, you're thanking us? That was like amazing that they're thanking us. No, wait a minute, we're thanking you. Hi, my name is Alita Adams. And in August, on August 23rd, 2001, I was studying collage with Joan Hall. Um, we put together some work, and then I had my next meeting with her on September, uh, I think it was September 21st of 2001. And Joan suggested we take a look at what I had done in August before we went ahead. The theme was basically what happened on September 11th, 2001. There was the World Trade Center, the airplane, a kind of a Christ figure at the bottom, a, a religious figure, and the Taj Mahal, which could very easily translate into some Middle Eastern building. So um, my sense was that there was just a huge amount of psychic energy around the September 11th event, and many artists or people who are sensitive to that kind of energy did work that presaged the event. I started volunteering the weekend after 9-11. Um, I went down to Pier 40 repeatedly, which was the farthest you could, I could get down on my bike to the site. And uh, I kept asking there if they needed people to volunteer. I'm not quite sure why I was so driven to do it. I just felt like everyone else in New York, I had to do something to help. And I went down there um, one time and I saw that they had a list of specific supplies that they needed at the site and I thought well this is something I can do I run an email list I'll just email them my list and say look you know they need this kind of gloves and this kind of band-aids and um, very specific items the organization that I volunteered with down at Ground Zero was called WTC Ground Zero Relief and they were a volunteer organization run out of a warehouse on Spring Street right at Greenwich and what we would do is bring specific needed supplies down to the site. We would find out from being down there by talking to the people who are coming off the pile, by talking to the people at supply caches, the FEMA workers, you know, what exactly do you need and what aren't you getting? Um, and then we would we'd get those supplies. And the group that I'm in, the Impossibles, again, we decided to do a song. What actually came out of the m group um, Public Enemy, who we had actually come together with initially, um, and Chuck D, who was very outspoken against uh, in, after, in the following uh, September 11th in the hip hop community, he knew, he saw an Ani DeFranco poem, who is, uh, she's a very well known uh, musician, sort of alternative rock. And she had a poem which was entitled, and it was speaking specifically about September 11th and the response that we, we, we needed to have. Um, so we all, he thought this was a great idea. And we all just came together. We all met. Uh, we had a conference one weekend in February of 2002. And we went to Long Island to Chuck D's house. And all of us came together and recorded the, everyone read a different verse or a part, portion of the poem. These thoughts were all in my mind. The cloud downtown, the change in New York, the, no, the lights being out. There were no cars in, in this neighborhood at all. You could walk in the streets anywhere you wanted to go. And all I kept thinking was, you know, are these the people who died, can they see us like here? Do they see how much we care and how upset and how much we're feeling for them? And the music that came in those five minutes was a song called We'll Carry On. And interestingly enough, I didn't know it at the time, that song would end up being um, a CD which would represent songs by firefighters and volunteers that I met down at Ground Zero, uh, police, people in the Port Authority, and musicians in New York. Um, and it became a focus of, I like to think of it now as healing through music in a way that I don't think any of us were aware that we were doing or needed to do, just was what felt right at the time. They wanted us to do, give things to the, bring things to the police station here. So uh, some of us would cook meals and uh, bring them, or huge pots of whatever, and bring them to the, the precinct. And we felt that we were doing some of our part there uh, to help. I was motivated to create a work of art 
that was very emotional for me. And this is the piece. It, um, it was showing a figure holding a portrait of a loved one in front of her chest. But it, she looks grief-stricken. And this was done in August, uh, just before the September 11th happening. And um, after it was all over, I saw people in the paper, I mean, after the thing happened, there were pictures of people holding photographs of their loved ones up in front of their chest. I thought, this is just too much. I didn't at first know what I wanted to say or do. I lived it. The smell from the world trade, w walking the streets, not seeing too many cars. The bridges were very carefully watched. Everything was being watched. The overhead flight of the jets. We were constantly bombarded with the realization that 9-11 happened and could happen again. And of course, there was the terrible sorrow of all those lives lost, and knowing how they were lost. And for me, the firemen, I couldn't believe that many firemen went with those buildings. Even though I, f I came from a different country, and I came to America, I thought I would have a lot of security in this country, because it's one of the most powerful countries in the world. And just to see something like that happen just told me that we're very vulnerable, no matter how much weaponry and you know, how much power we have. So my art has changed. I just think it might be some ghost that's, that's giving me a look there, you know? Some kind of somebody's spirit. Or looking at myself in the mirror and being, <laughs> being terrified of, of terrorists, or just terrified in general. Just a generalized fear, because I felt that I, that I worked through my own fear about getting dead myself. Actually, this is about a f my fear that everything's going to go wrong and continue to go wrong one day at a time. For one, I think when you lived on the west side of Manhattan, below 14th Street, you began to smell every single day the world trade, the electric, the smoke. I knew every time they found bodies. One of the ways it's affected this whole experience is that it scared the hell out of me. After 9-11, I just wanted to do pretty pictures of flowers or something innocuous, something that wouldn't have any um, emotional content or bearing or could possibly be visionary. And I thought, yeah, I, I, I'll do decorative work. I'll make jewelry. I'll do something, you know. So I didn't work. I, I just didn't. All artists felt, having seen the horrible sight of the, of the uh, people jumping off of the building, and that was the most, one of the most painful things, that our helplessness when we were up on the roof of West Beth, and the artist extended their arms out, screaming, an attempt to try to stop the people from jumping, but we were too far away. And, and we couldn't prevent them. I mean, we went back on the first day of work, and um, um, it was like the whole—it was like a crime scene. The whole, whole campus was surrounded by the National Guard. Um, we could see the wreckage burning and smoking in the background. We could smell it. The whole campus smelled. It, it was really a, a pretty grim experience. Uh, and I tried to be optimistic because I felt like the students were taking cues from me. And if I get all out of control and upset, it's going to be, you know, infectious. I felt like I had to write about this. I felt I had an obligation to write about it. Because um, I thought, here I am. I'm teaching at the only college in America that's had a building destroyed by a terrorist attack. I have something to say about this. So it was the story about this remedial English class, struggling immigrants, who were off to a very, very wonderful start at the beginning of the semester. And then, boom, everything fell apart, of course, because of the attack. And like, what in God's name would it be like to come back and resume this class in this campus that is like completely different? Um, so I tried to write the piece talking about the class and how it was almost like it felt like I, we, we've, we've got to get through this semester. This is like our duty. It's almost like our patriotic duty for me to get this group to the end of the class and pass that final. And teaching took on this whole like almost like missionary quality that it never had before um, and probably never will again. 9-11 impacted me in, with the concept that life is very short. and. Uh, one of my professors at Yale, Robert Reed at Yale and at Skidmore, had said, is what you mean is that what is being seen? It was one of his most wonderful sentences. 
I began thinking, I've got to do everything faster. Life is so short. I wanted to cut to the quick. And the image that I wanted to present had to be very clear and had to have a graphic orientation. So I decided that a cutouts were very clean and clear. And I began leaving uh, minuscule detail out as well as the background for a more rapid reading. And this series began of the cutouts where um, the, the uh, pieces are physically carved out um, with a skill saw. And it's a flat surface, a relatively fat, flat surface. And slowly I started getting back into my work. And actually, my work is now um, still exploring these, these figures, um, collages, assemblages, uh, found art and materials. But somehow my work has always been dark. And I, I think I'm aware of it more now. I mean, the dark side was always there, but now I really am conscious of it. So uh, it's not that I'm trying to lighten up. Um, I just feel whatever comes out now, I'm, I'm ready to just let it happen. I think that for me, how uh, it affected me personally was that it angered me. I was really anger, angered. And I, as a dancer, I, my work always has a meaning to it, but it was abstract. And I felt it's time now to get into a, a profession, or whatever you want to call it, that I can speak through. And video and the documentary that I did about West Beth gave me an opportunity to speak my thoughts. But on a personal level, um, I've, I've had a lot of uh, flashbacks from my, my childhood memories of the Second World War, and that's been very hard. Um, you know, certainly it's affected my sleep, and uh, you know, my um, my mental health is certainly affected. <laughs> I mean, right after the right after it happened, I just I just thought, you know, what I'm doing is so unimportant and so insignificant. I was really doubting myself. And it took, it took quite a while to kind of like come back and just say, hey, you know what? Life continues no matter how terrible it is. The artwork that I've been involved in is a combination of probably my love of the, this country, the American flag. Um, I'm not a great believer of flaunting it, but I do love the flag because I'm a great history buff. I know what it took to make that flag occur. And we've not done everything perfectly in this country. But we are a growing democracy. And you have to love the goodness of it. So my artwork is involved in that. My artwork has flags. It has the firemen that I love and respect very much. And it also has a part of myself that is very involved in trying to show what I feel about 9-11, what I feel about the terror that we live through, what I feel about the, the joy of this country. What is the impact that 9-11 has had? on the art community in New York, or for that matter, the United States, or for that matter, the world. I think it's pretty profound. Well, it was horrible. And the things I saw as a volunteer, being at the site, being there on a daily basis, meeting people who were on the pile every day, I mean, those, those, those were horrible, horrible things that no human being on this earth should have had to witness. And how do you process that? How do you go on? How do you carry on? Living in Lower Manhattan, you couldn't help notice the uh, powerful effect that 9-11 had on the economy of New York City. That uh, in addition to restaurants, shops uh, that had been there for 20 years biting the dust, uh, gallery after gallery went under. And it was devastating for the art scene and for artists. All the stock market people left Wall Street and they went to New Jersey and they kicked out all the artists from Jersey City. And some went to South Beach, but others are going to Williamsburg. As far as the rest of the whole writing world went, 
Um, I mean, I think the whole freelance writing economy has been very affected by the recession and the impact of 9-11, because, I mean, the publishing industry is pretty much centered here in New York. Most of the magazines that people write for do come out of New York. A lot of galleries and, and businesses in that area had very serious problems after 9-11, because they were used to, to uh, getting all these people who worked in the buildings. At least 10,000 people a day get to show up and buy all kinds of things in the neighborhood and go to the local galleries and uh, film processing places and, all, and restaurants, I guess, mainly. And, and a lot of those people went out of business. They just did not have enough money to pay their rent. It was really devastating. The immediate couple of weeks after 9-11, I really didn't do any commercial work. Uh, I canceled a lot of jobs. Um, and I, I think that I was probably just as in shock as everyone seeing what I saw and trying to grasp what was going on. So I did a lot of photography. After 9-11, basically everything in music world that I was participating in came to a complete stop. I had tour canceled, I had projects canceled, I had gigs canceled, and my income stopped. Everything stopped. It was very drastic. And everyone I know in the music industry, people left New York, tours, no one went anywhere. Um, it was devastating. And of course, uh, the first uh, people to suffer, artists are a luxury. <laughs> they're a luxury to life, and they're worth far more than frequently they're ever paid for it. And so, naturally, luxuries go first when economics become hard. I feel in a way, though, how it impacted New York and maybe America in general is it's a terrible tragedy, but in the long run, I think it did something in a positive way. And I'm, t I'm speaking, um, not saying it was a positive experience, but saying that it made Americans feel that we're as vulnerable and the same as people all over the world, whereas I always felt I couldn't be touched. I mean, I grew up in a world where we were protected. We're living here in the United States, in New York, nothing can happen. And all of a sudden, we're now the same as everyone else. The nature of the artwork is uh, the public has had a feeling of um, cocooning, sort of a, a, nor a weird word, but staying at home, bonding with the family. And so the nature of the type of artwork that's, that is selling well has to do with home-like qualities or subject matter that has to do, has to do with family and, uh, and, and ties to uh, heritage. I think a lot of artists are immobilized. I think, like myself, there are a lot of artists that, that kind of felt they couldn't work very easily after this experience. Maybe it was the shock or the fear or just the fact that there's so much you want to do to just play. I mean, you just want to live each moment, uh, feel that life might be very short, and so who knows what's going to come next. And, of course, creating art is one of the one wonderful things to do, but there was this block. I think the more corporate side has really kind of stayed away from it. They, they prefer to keep hip-hop apolitical uh, to, because in order to sell records, it's better to not make, have any kind of position. Um, but the more underground and less mainstream artists, and with a few exceptions in the mainstream world, um, have managed to say something about this. You've got to find a different uh, agenda. The agenda we have right now doesn't work. The agenda we have to find is that is another way to approach the people. I believe in the people. Before 9-11, I think American artists could um, have their head in the sand and just do their thing. Um, but after 9-11, with the paradigm shift um, and the explosion of information because of technology and the internet, uh, artists now are interested in what the rest of the world is thinking. We're dealing with it. We're letting it seep in. We're letting ourselves talk about something that has had a devastating effect. It cripples the human race every time something like that occurs, obviously. But artists have the unique ability whether they're poets or playwrights or writers or painters or photographers, to be able to take that and give back a feeling of despair, of love, of loss, and 
the possibility of renewal. Because renewal has to happen. We have to have belief that something good comes out of something so devastating. A lot of strangely positive things came out of this traumatic experience for people as they came together. And as we found ways of healing and talking and integrating this experience into our lives, I, I see it as a real ongoing process. And I, I do feel very, very strongly that the arts help in a very unconscious way to help us kind of integrate what a woman I volunteered with said very eloquently in that art helps express the inexpressible. And I feel very strongly that that's, that's completely true for me as an artist. And maybe, maybe we can be like the pianist in Polanski's movie and just keep, keep playing Chopin. <laughs>